what basically has happened here is the destruction of my livelihood. I'm not recovering from the delisting that occurred due to a false report last August. The best way I could describe it to your honor is I think Airbnb feels like we've reinstated her and that's great. This market has 2,000 hosts. It's hyper competitive. Even with that, due to my experience and location, I was doing just fine. And this situation is basically, I don't know if your honor watched the Kentucky Derby where a horse came over and bumped two horses and impeded a third. It's like the race gets run and if you're knocked out, you're, you're dead forever because when someone's searching for lodging in Baltimore, we've got 2,000 listings, they really only see the top 18 listings. So that's determined like basically like how, how well are you doing? And if you've been completely off the platform for eight months, you really just drop like a stone. My calendar is empty going forward, barring one very modest booking. Uh, I'm not even getting inquiries. So that is the situation vis-a-vis -vis the damages. I was overly optimistic, I think, at each stage here that small claims would be able to rectify small damages and that at the hearing in March, um, the judge there could help with this situation. The end of April really tells you how your summer is going to go. I'm usually completely booked out. And right now, where I'd usually be looking at 7000 in income, um, I'm looking at $250 over the next three months. Now, where that leaves us is this is now a de novo appeal mm -hmm. before the court for trial. Well, then, let's hear sure. argument on the terms of service now. It's his motion to dismiss, so uh, I will hear from Mr. Evans first. Ms. Bellavo cannot assert a claim for loss of profits because the terms of service uh, preclude uh, her from... Um, asserting such a claim. Correct? Your Honor, that is correct. All right. We should be heard. Yes, Your Honor. I would submit that Ms. Bellavo has been a host with Airbnb since December 2013 when she originally agreed to the terms of service. And as noted in uh, the motion, the, um, Airbnb periodically updates its terms of service and re additionally requires um, hosts such as Ms. Bellavo to continually agree in order to continue to use the online platform. Um, exhibit one submitted in support of the motion, I think pretty thoroughly outlines the agreement process. Um, and exhibit E to the declaration of exhibit one um, is the terms of service that were in effect in August 2018. In August 2018 and section 17.1 precludes um, claims for lost profits. And so I would submit that. And, and I would just emphasize, Your Honor, that she was suspended in August 2018 following a credible report by a guest that there was an unsecured firearm in the property. And this was a serious allegation that my client, Airbnb, should have investigated and did investigate. And pursuant to Section 15.4 of the Terms of Service, Airbnb may immediately, without notice, terminate this agreement and or stop providing access to the Airbnb platform if Airbnb believes in good faith that such action is reasonably necessary to protect the personal safety or property of Airbnb, its members, or, th or third parties. This would include guests, Your Honor, such as the guests that reported that there was a 9mm handgun unsecured near the front door of the host's property. And just for the record, I would like to read section 17.1 of the Terms of Service, which addresses the issue um, of lost profits, neither Airbnb nor any other party involved in creating, producing, or delivering the Airbnb platform or collective content will be liable for any incidental, special, exemplary, or consequential damages, including lost profits. And it goes on to say, from the use or inability to use the Airbnb platform or collective content. 
Your Honor, this is ultimately a simple dispute. The appellant is seeking damages pursuant to a contract that she signed that permitted her to be a host that does not allow her to recover the types of damages that she so seeks. So for those reasons, Your Honor, we request that you grant her a motion to dismiss. Thank you. All right. Thank you. And there's no dispute in this case that Ms. Beliveau has been restored. Again, that may not be the term of art, but that she's back on Airbnb. But as she has stated, her claim really is that doesn't – her claim, of course, is that, as she said this morning, not only that she lost profits as a result, but she's continuing to lose income as a result. But she – I'm sorry. I can't say anything simply. Everybody agrees she's been restored, right? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Your Honor, that's a tremendous question here. I don't have any way to determine whether I have been shadow banned. Let's talk about restored. You've heard Mr. Evans' argument. I will now hear from you on the issue of whether the terms of service bar this suit because the terms of service do not permit you to bring an action for consequential damages. Thank you, Your Honor. I'm glad to talk about that. My position here is that this is an unenforceable contract. And that paradoxically, although Airbnb is citing Section 15, which says we can dismiss you if we think something's going on, and Section 17, which say you can't have damages and we're going to force arbitration, you can only go to small claims court. If you go to small claims, you can't go on to – you have to go back to arbitration. All of these assertions by the defendant paradoxically tell us that we have an unenforceable contract. We are absolutely in a straitjacket. There's just a towering imbalance between what an Airbnb host can negotiate with Airbnb and what the company asked us to do. We have a no win, no wiggle room, no chance of survival box because over the course of time, and this happened to me with 500 guests, one of them is going to come up with some squirrely issue. And when that squirrely issue shows up, there is no due process and there's no fairness and you are out. So you are basically sent into what I think is a cattle shoot of futility. They say, okay, you had a problem. There's nothing at Airbnb that tells you how to solve the problem. I got thrown off without being talked to about what was even going on or told what was going on. And then you're said go to arbitration. Airbnb has been ignoring arbitration claims. Don't respond. They kind of just ghost you. Let me ask you that if I might because your arguments are very eloquent. So they intrigue me. But isn't the squirrely tenants, that's sort of part of the whole landscape. Exactly. So when you as you or any renter, if that's the right term, enter into this relationship with Airbnb, you know the rules of the game going forward. That if you get squirrely tenants, you're going to be in jeopardy because the rules of the game are that it's not like a governmental regime under which there's a due process hearing, etc. Doesn't the renter kind of know that going in? No, that's a great question, Your Honor. I would say that when you started in 2013 and 14, it was supposed to be this wonderful sharing opportunity for me to get international visitors coming to Hopkins and really help them find a new house in Baltimore. That's what we call the come on. Exactly. There was a Kool-Aid drunk. And then, so you trust the company. You trust the company that, oh, they're going to look at the fact that I'm a super host and no one's ever talked about a weapon. And then I said, I really don't even know what you're talking about with a weapon. You sort of think, well, you know, I don't really get what's going on here. And then all of a sudden, 
we're all getting educated actually via this case today, Your Honor, which is, if you, I'm sure you realize it's kind of a massive case for us one million host. You're right on a bullseye of something. Mm -hmm. And literally, we come into court thinking, oh, you know, I can, I can demonstrate there is no weapon. I'll bring the evidence. And this really should solve it. And then none of us really knew what that 15 and 17 together, and if I can add an aside, the European Union doesn't allow Section 17. You can, you, and you are liable for negligence in Europe, but not Maryland. So I think well, none and, of us and, knew and about it. And caused me to reflect, of course, as you may know, there's a controversy uh, in the legal community because uh, uh, I think Justice Breyer and Justice, uh, uh, one other justice have from time to time advocated using uh, foreign sources of law in their interpretation of the Constitution. Your Honor, it kills me to point to Europe because I love our system and I think our system is a magnificent system, but I'm just going to bend my own role and say let's look to Europe on this one. Okay. And that's a great point. Um, so I have fourfold problems with this contract. No host has ever been consulted or negotiated with for these terms of service. It's take it or leave it. Yes, I signed it seven times. What choice did I have? What choice have any of the million of us had? Um, you have the choice not to contract with uh Airbnb. That's all my choices, Your Honor. You're right. We have here these one-sided terms of service have a $38 billion company on one side and host on the other. This company doesn't owe a one stick of furniture outside of its offices. And all the risks are assigned to the host. All of them. So, to me, this is like, you know, there's always a seesaw where you say, yes, Airbnb had a lot of development costs, admin costs, and you want to give away some of your bargaining power so you can benefit from all Airbnb's great work. But this seesaw, in my opinion, it's not just tilted, it's absolutely vertical, and, and further to that, they're pounding us on the head with these terms. Um, these terms of service aren't permitted for innkeepers. Um, this goes back to Winter Bottom versus White in 1848. Well, and you know, that, that, that's, that's a very interesting point as well, because, you know, that part of Airbnb's business model from which its hosts benefit is the fact that it avoids the uh, restrictions and regulations that govern most other innkeepers, hotels, etc. So again, that's part of the economic landscape that, that you, that the hosts all chose. That's that's part of what it attracted the hosts. And it's all getting migrated over. Our city council, this January, has started to regulate us. We're becoming a public utility, and that kind of means, the way I under, I would interpret for your honor the winter bottom case is this. There's kind of saying things are going to go wrong here. They're just going to go wrong. You're going to go to and um, counsel's case law looks at a lot of cases of guests. They go to some listing and it's terrible or it's not there and they lost $8,000 and there's all kinds of cases like that. Things go wrong all the time. And I think if you're a public utility, the point of this precedent is Airbnb needs, as Europe has determined, to be liable when stuff goes on. And right now we hold the bag when guests cancel, and we hold the bag when they lie about your property, and we hold the bag if the police come and you've got $8,000 of damage, they never help you. So we hold all the bags here, and this seesaw is a pile driver for us. And we're late people, these change constantly. There's been seven terms of service since I've been there. And none of the guests staying with me before or after 
totaling 650 guests. Maybe they took extra time because they wanted to perform a careful examination of the claim. Oh, can we talk about that, Your Honor? Pardon? Can we talk about that? No, I, I was just uh, being hypothetical because, uh, as I say, you raise very interesting points. Mm -hmm. it, it being your motion, is there any reply? Your Honor, I would just add a few things. Again, I would just reiterate that to the extent our claim is for negligence, it, should, it is barred by the economic loss doctrine. But let me just clarify one thing. I, I, I am going to rule against you, Ms. Belleville, and um, I'm really not, I, I'm in no way uh, being ironic. Uh, it, uh, I do truly consider your argument eloquent. Um, and in fact, if you choose to take this to the next level, I will watch the outcome of this case with interest. I am going to rule against you is because I don't conclude that uh, the agreement is unconscionable. Uh, and I'll explain why. Uh, let me begin by saying there, there's no doubt in my mind that this is a contract of adhesion. Uh, a, a host who contracts with Airbnb um, can't negotiate the terms of service. Uh, they are imposed upon uh, the host, and therefore the host has uh, the opportunity uh, uh, to take it or leave it. And that's really the host's only choice because there's no room for negotiation and therefore the host can either choose to contract with Airbnb and accept the terms of service or choose not to contract with Airbnb if he or she does not want to accept the terms of service. So it is a contract of adhesion. But Maryland law, and um, I want to emphasize that I am, uh, in making this decision, applying the terms of Maryland law as I understand them to be, uh, notwithstanding what might be, as Ms. Bellavo points out, uh, reasons from this case to conclude that the law should be differently in the state of Maryland. But nevertheless, I sit as a circuit court judge, and therefore I'm bound by the decisions of the Court of Special Appeals and the Court of Appeals uh, and have to make my decision in accordance with those cases. Um, so in Walter versus Sovereign Bank, 386 Maryland 412, 2005, which is, I think, one of the seminal opinions on, more recent opinions on unconscionability in the contract setting, the court said, quoting from uh, an opinion from Judge Wilner in the Court of Special Appeals, the fact that a contract is one of adhesion does not mean that either it or any of its terms are invalid or unenforceable. A court will, to be sure, look at the contract and its terms with some special care, as in most cases it will refuse to enforce terms that it finds unconscionable and will construe ambiguities against the draftsman, but it will not simply excise or ignore terms merely because in the given case they may operate to the perceived detriment of the weaker party. Uh, therefore, and, and this is after the quote, assuming that arguendo that the agreement in that case is in fact a contract of adhesion, that is not the end of the inquiry. We must examine the substance of the particular provision at issue to decide whether it is unconscionable. To that end, we must consider whether the terms in the arbitration clause are so one-sided as to oppress or unfairly surprise an innocent party or whether there exists an egregious imbalance in the obligations and rights imposed by the arbitration clause. Most of the cases that have discussed un unconscionability and most of the cases that were cited in Appellee's motion in this case that specifically involved Airbnb also involve arbitration agreements or agreements to arbitrate. But the same analysis applies to a clause limiting damages, and uh, I do not believe that the substance of a clause limiting damages is so one-sided or egregious in substance as to make it unconscionable. And I, I would refer, among other cases, to Bond versus Nibco, 96 Maryland Appellate 127, uh, which involves a contractual term, in that case a limited warranty, excluding incidental and consequential damages. And 
that was in the context of the sale of goods and therefore was based upon the provisions of the Uniform Commercial Code, which provide, and the court concluded in that case, that a clause limiting damages or excluding recovery for damages in a commercial context is not unconscionable. And from that, I derived the conclusion that it is Maryland law that in the commercial context, and this is certainly, this contract is a commercial contract, it is not, a clause limiting recovery of damages is not unconscionable in substance. I would also note for the record that there are cases from other states specifically dealing with the Airbnb contract. Again, as previously stated, they are in the context of the arbitration provision, but some of them one can get online through Google, such as Sheldon v. Airbnb, that's the United States District Court for the District of Columbia, and one is Plaza v. Airbnb, that's 289 FS, heads up the third, 537, a case in the Southern District of New York, 2018. And therefore, I have to say, notwithstanding what is a very vigorous and cogent argument to the contrary, that it appears that other courts have found that the Airbnb terms of service are not unconscionable in the face of claims that they are. So for all of those reasons, I conclude that the provision is not unconscionable, and therefore I'm going to grant the motion and dismiss the claim or enter judgment against Ms. Belliveau. And as I say, I have been absorbed by your argument, notwithstanding the fact that I have ruled against you, and you probably don't need me to tell you, but you do have the right to file a petition for certiorari to the Court of Appeals to get me reversed. Thank you. Thank you.